Let us take a look at how to integrate Firebase Authentication with a React application and an Express server. Okay, so let's begin with the sequence diagram just so that we can get a clear picture of the whole process. So first of all, the user opens the React application. Then they can click on the login button, which will act as a sign in and sign up button. Next, the React application will communicate with the Firebase microservice and open up a provider. So let's say the Google provider. And then the user will be prompted to log in via this provider. And once they are authenticated, Firebase will return an access token to our React application. So if all of this is successful, well, as far as Firebase is concerned, the user is now authenticated. But we need to tell our server, hey, this user is authenticated. For that, the React application, once it gets this access token provided by Firebase, it will send a post login request with the access token to our server. Now, the server will create a session token using the Firebase admin SDK. Then it will find or create the user in our own database. And then it is going to set this session token from Firebase as an HTTP only cookie and also return the user information we queried from the database. That way, the React application can show the user information in the UI. Now, this step is important because since we're setting an HTTP only cookie, we cannot access it with JavaScript, but it has the great benefit of any request we make to our server. We can create an auth guard or middleware that is going to extract the session token and validate everything, which simplifies things a lot. So once this is done, the React application will store the user information in memory using Sustan, the Redux, whatever. So again, this is for signing in or signing up. We will not have a sign up dedicated endpoint because after all, Firebase will handle the authentication for us. We don't need to check if the user is created in our database or not. We just synchronize everything via the access token provided and we do all of these validation and logic. Now, what if the user visits the website later on and they are indeed authenticated? Because since we're storing the session token as an HTTP only cookie, unless the user deletes all of their cookies, they will still be authenticated. Well, for that, I have this diagram for returning user authentication process. So the user opens the application with the session token in a cookie. Now the React application will automatically fetch the me endpoint with the session token. Now the React application, as I told you before, doesn't need to handle the logic of sending the session token because, well, it's stored in the cookies. By default, this token will be for every single request the client makes. Again, simplifying the process further. Now, once we have passed in the session token, the server will communicate with the Firebase microservice and check if the session token is valid. If it isn't, we'll just return a 403 forbidden. Otherwise, we can consult the user information with our database. And then the server returns the user information to the React application. And at this point, we repeat this step right here. We just store the user information with Sustand and call it a day. So what tools are we going to use for this? Well, we're just going to be using a simple Express server, a React application, and the Firebase microservice. So let's start with creating the Firebase project. So come here to the console.firebase.google.com and then we're going to click on this add a project. Now let's say this will be test project and then continue and I'll disable this. So once you have the project created, we can now continue and we're going to come here over to project settings and come here to your applications. And this is going to be a web application. So this will be web app and then we register the application. And now you need to store this Firebase configuration somewhere. 
So I'm just going to copy it and paste it over to my notepad. Once you have this, we can continue to the console. Now let's come here to the left panel. Let's come over to all products and then authentication. Now here, let's click on get started. Once we have this, we'll keep this simple, so only Google for now. And let's enable this, and then we can save this. So once we have this enabled, we can come here to Project Settings, and then Service Accounts. Make sure you're Node.js, and then we can generate a new private key. So let's click on Generate Key, and this will download a file with all of the keys. Now for this, I'll be using NX, which is a tool for building monorepos. You can use any tool you want. In the end, the implementation I'll show you is framework agnostic. You can implement it wherever you want. But if you're going to be building a React and Express application, then you should be using monorepos either way. So now let's go step by step creating this monorepo. So let's write MPX create an X workspace and then let us specify the package manager to be yarn. Now this is optional, you can use npm, pmpm, whatever. And we'll also need to pass in another flag saying the preset will be equal to TypeScript. I'll name this monorepo as Firebase Auth React Express. Let's say no. And once this is done installing, we can change directory into Firebase Auth React Express. Now I'll open up Visual Studio Code. And as we can see, we don't have anything. There are no applications nor libraries in this monorepo. So for that, let's start by creating the React application. So let's yarn add dash d as a dev dependency and then nx slash vit. And now we can generate a React application. So NX, G, then at NX, React application, let's call it client. And then let's specify the bundler to be Vit. And we're getting an error because we're actually missing the NX React library. So let us add it. Yarn add NX, then React. And now we can create the application and I don't care about the styles. You can choose whatever you want here. Now let's say yes to the react router and I'll not have any testing. And now, as we can see, we have the client application, but I don't want to have everything laid out here. I want them to be separated. So we have the applications and the libraries. So for this, I'll come here in my terminal and I'll write NX generate, then workspace and then move. So this command will make sure to update everything that is required, such as paths and whatnot to this new location. So we can say project, then client, and then the destination will say apps slash and then client. And let's say as provided and let's say yes. And once this is done, as we can see, we have the client under this directory. Now let us create a TypeScript library so that we can store all of the types between the client and the server. So we can leverage type safety as much as possible. So for that, I'll come here and I'll say NX, generate, then NX, then node, then I'll say it's a library, and then let's call it API contracts. Now we get an error because we don't have this node library. So yarn add dash d nx slash node. And now in fact, instead of doing everything with the CLI, nx has an extension, which is the nx console. So if you have it installed, you can come here and then click on generate and it will ask for the name. So let's say API contracts, then unit tester none, no tests. Then we'll specify the bundler to BTSC and then the directory under libs slash API client. And then the import path will be at and then whatever your root project is called. 
In my case, since this is a pet project, I'll just leave it as at my org slash and then the name of the library. So API client. And then I'll click here on generate. And now if I come here, we have this library. Now I'm having some issues running the client. If you get this error as well, where it says cannot read properties of undefined reading executor. What I would recommend is actually removing recursively the client. And what we're going to do instead is come here over to the NX console. We'll click here on generate and then react application. And then let us call this client. The bundler will be vit the directory. So apps slash client. And then we can click here on generate. And once this is done, we can come back here and do NX serve client. And as we can see, it now works. So if I open localhost, as we can see, we get this React single page application. And I'm in dark mode, so this is how it looks like. Now let us start with the client. So let's come here and I'll open up a new terminal and I'll say yarn add Firebase. So this is the SDK for the client so that we can tell Firebase, hey, redirect the user to the Google login provider, which is what is going to give us this access token. So now we can come here under client and then I'll create a folder called lib and this will have another one called configs and then we'll have one called firebase-config.ts. Now what I'm going to do is export const firebase app is equal to and we'll import initialize app from firebase dash app and we actually need get up and get ups so we're gonna check get ups we invoke this we get the length and we check if the length is greater than zero if it is, we need to get the already instantiated application. Otherwise, we need to initialize the application. Now, the reason we're doing this is because with Firebase, you can have multiple applications. In our case, we're just going to be using the authentication app. So to avoid Firebase initializing the application over and over and over again, every time we use this application, they have this function to check the stored applications we have created. And so if there are no applications, so it means this is the first time the user loads the React application, then it is going to initialize the application. Otherwise, it is going to get the already existing application. And now we can pass in some config. So we'll say API key, which is the string used when calling certain APIs. So this is not the private key. This is just a key so that the Firebase client application can use it to authenticate with the providers and whatnot. In this case, since I'm using vit, I'll say import dot meta dot env and then vit Firebase API key. Now we prefix this with vid because this is the way of telling vid that we're accessing a public environment variable which means that this is going to be shipped to the client. And this is important because in this monorepo, we're going to have environment variables that should never be exposed to a client, such as the database connection, like the passwords. So with this way, we can have a separation of concerns by telling vid, hey, this will be a public environment variable. So it's okay to expose it to the client. And we also need the auth domain. Now we can come here, export const auth is equal to get auth, and we pass in the Firebase application. Now this function comes from the Firebase dash auth module. And now we can also create the Google auth provider. So new Google auth provider, which we import from this module as well. And now we can export a function sign in with Google. This will return a promise of, and let's actually not specify anything, and let's say return sign in with pop up. And this comes from the same module. Now, what this is returning to us is a promise of user credential. However, just to make sure that we're synchronizing everything, we can say return type and then type of, 
and then sign in with Google. And this actually returns a promise, I believe. So we're saying promise two times. And this is actually sign in with pop-up. Now we need to specify the environment variables. So let's create a top level file dot env. And in this one, we're going to have these two keys. So I'll copy this, paste it here, as well as this one. And if you recall, I copied all of the information they gave us for our web application, which is this one. So we have the API key, auth domain, and some other properties. In this case, we only need these two. So I'll copy the key they provided me and the auth domain. So now let us add yarn add react router dom. And now I'll come here and get rid of the app directory. And then I'll come here in the main file, get rid of this. And then we'll define the router. So create browser router. So this will be an array. And now we can say router provider. And then we pass in the router. Now this one accepts an object. So we have the path. So this will be our login page. For now, let's say element div home and login page. And then we're going to have the dashboard, which is protected. So path, dashboard, and then the element dashboard page. Now, if I save this and come back here, as we can see, we have the home and login page. If I go over to slash dashboard, we get the dashboard page. So let us now implement the login page. So I'll come here under source, then pages and I'll have the index.page.tsx. And we're going to export const the home page, which will be a react.functional component. And let us just return hey from home page slash login. And now I'll come here over to the main and I'll import the home page, which is from slash pages index dot page. Now, as we can see, everything is working just fine. So we'll keep this minimal. What I'm going to do is create an asynchronous function, handle sign in, promise of void, and then I'll come here and create a simple div, and we'll have a button on click. This will invoke the sign in. So we mark it as void as we're not going to use that then or await the function. We just need to invoke it and then we'll say sign in. Now, if I save this, as we can see, we have this sign in button. So now let's handle the logic for the Google provider. So for this, we're going to use try catch, then the error. And let's just console that error, the error. Now we can get the user credentials. So user credentials is equal to await sign in with Google and we invoke this function. And now we can get access to the access token. So await user credentials dot user dot get ID token. And for now, let's say access token. Now, if I come back here, Nothing is being rendered. Let's see for any error. Invalid API key. So let's log to the console in the Firebase config, the environment variables, just to make sure that they are actually getting loaded. Now, if I come back here, as we can see, they are undefined. And that's because we haven't reset the process. So now if we refresh the process and come back here, as we can see, we get the API key and auth domain. And now the button is rendered. Now, if I click on this button, as we can see, we get the sign in pop up. So everything is working just fine. And in fact, this pop up is being rendered whenever we invoke the sign in with Google. So this function is the one that is opening up the pop-up. 
But if we come here, we can also sign in with redirect. So sign in with redirect. So what this is going to do is simply redirect the user to the Google page instead of having this small window. Now you can use whichever you want. For simplicity reasons, I'll just use the pop-up. So now let's try and sign in. And as we can see, upon sign in, we get the success token. So again, this is issued by the Firebase microservice. So we can use the success token, pass it over to our server, validate the access token, and then issue a session token. So now let's move on to the server implementation. So what I'm going to do is open up a new terminal and I'll write yarn add and then add TS rest dash, then react query and then TS rest nest and finally sod. And once we have them, I'll come here over to leaves, then API client, and then I'll come here to API contracts and I'll export a type user. And this one will have an email. This one will have a name, which can be nullable. And then the image. So all of this information will come from the Firebase authentication. And then we can create a contract. So we can say const C for contract. In need contract. And this comes from in need contract. And I did not install that one. So yarnar ts rest core and then i'll say from at ts rest slash core and then we can create our auth contract so we can say export const auth contract is equal to c dot router and then we're going to have a login endpoint now the method will be post the path will be slash login there won't be a body so c dot type and let's say no but we need some headers so we need to pass in the header we're going to use sod to validate the data coming in so we're going to say this will be an object with authorization which must be a string and must start with bearer that way we can ensure that we get access to the token or well, at least whatever comes after the bearer. We'll also say strict status codes to be true. And finally, the responses. So we can return from the server a 200. So type, in that case, this is successful. So the user is successfully logged in. We will return a user. Otherwise, we can say bad request, then 401, then 404 if the user is not found, and finally 500 for internal server error. And I forgot to add commas here. And for the second argument for the router function, we can pass in another object, and then we can say path prefix to be slash auth. So all of these will be prepended with slash auth. So slash auth, then login. Now I just noticed it is not using my prettier configuration, but I'm not going to write anything here, so I'll just delete this. And now if I modify something, it is now using my configuration. Obviously in a real production monorepo, you'd have the prettier configuration file. Now you might be wondering, what is this TS REST library? Well, if I come here and search for TS REST and then open up the official documentation, as we can see, it is a library for type safety for your APIs. So if I come here and see the demo, as we can see, we have the client. So in this case, this would be the React application. You initialize the query client, you pass in the contract, and then you can say await client dot update post. Where does this come from? Well, if we take a look at the contract definition, which is what we did, they wrote an update post endpoint. So put, then the path slash posts, then the post ID. It has a summary, like a description, then the path params. So they define a sort of schema, and then they have the body and all of the responses. And then on the server, they can use this contract. 
So this is incredibly powerful because as we can see, they modified this property to text and now the client is throwing an error saying that the body dot whatever was here before doesn't exist. And as we can see, the same with message. So if you're familiar with libraries like TRPC, you already know what this does. But if you aren't familiar, it is simply a library where you define the types that your server must return so that your client, when communicating with your API, can be completely sure that it is handling everything as it is supposed to be. So obviously, this is just leveraging TypeScript so that the two, the API and the client, are synced up. So instead of having to go over to your client, defining your types, and the same for the server, you just define a single source of truth, and then you can use it on your API and client, and that way you get maximum type safety, which is absolutely great. So that's why we defined a contract for the auth contract. So we have the login endpoint. Now you might be wondering, why are we sometimes using sod, but other times using this c.type? Well, the reason is simple. sod validates the data. It makes sure that the data comes with this format. So we're telling the client it must send a header with the authorization property, and it must start with bearer. If this fails, the server will never execute the logic of the endpoint. However, the c.type is simply a way to define the type without enforcing a runtime validation. So this is just a way in TypeScript to say, hey, we just want a message back or we want the user back. But this is not being enforced in the runtime as opposed to sod. Now you could use sod here like the documentation specifies. But in my case, I feel like just defining the TypeScript types is more than enough. There's no need to validate the output data. Okay, so enough talking. How can we now use this contract? Well, if I come here to the index file, as we can see, it is exporting everything from this module, which means that any application that we have here can access this contract. So now let us generate the API application. So for this, let us write yarn add, then dash D and next, and then we need nest. So we're going to be using nest.js for the backend, but again, nest.js uses express under the hood. And in fact, you can pretty much copy and paste the code I'm going to show you into an express fastify whatever it is because ultimately what matters is the core concept, not the framework specific solution. And we also need an X webpack. So once you have this, you can generate a nest app called API. Now let's say derived. So it creates it under apps. So now as you can see, we have the API application. And this one has this main.ts file sets the global prefix to be API, and then the port will be 3000. And then application is running on this port. So actually we need to configure a couple of things. We need to get the cookie parser so that we can use cookies and set the HTTP only cookies. And we also need to enable cores so that our frontend can communicate with this API. So for this, make sure to add the cookie parser. So yarn add cookie parser. And then we also need the type definitions for cookie parser. So yarn add dash D types cookie parser. So once we have this, we can come here and say app.use cookie parser. And then we need to enable cores. So if process.em dot node amp is equal to development, then we want to enable cores. For who, let's just specify localhost 4200. And that's about it. Now we can try running this backend. So we can say nx serve API. And as we can see, application is running on localhost 3000. So now create a new terminal then cd into apps API, then we'll come here over to source, then app, 
And as we can see, we have the controller, the module, and the service for the application. But we need the auth module. So what I'm going to do is say nest generate, then module, and then auth no spec. We do not need testing. And let's do the same with a controller, no spec, and then the service. And now if I come here, as we can see, we have the controller, module, and service. For some reason, it created these spec files, so I'll get rid of them. And I just noticed that it was actually looking for the app module, not for the auth module. So if I come here to the app module, it should be importing the auth module, which is correct. Now let us implement the logic for the controller. So I'll come here and I'll say private read only logger, just so we can see any errors, then logger, then auth controller dot name. We also need the service. So constructor private read only auth service of type auth service. So this is being injected by the module as we can see here. And now we need to import the TS rest handler decorator. Now you might be wondering what is this decorator? Well, this decorator will generate, it's like a factory for more decorators that the library needs internally to be able to map the contract with the actual endpoint. For example, that means setting the endpoint for this contract. So now let's come here over to libraries, then the index.ts, and we'll say C init contract, and then export const contracts is equal to C dot router, and then auth is the auth contract. So this way we can merge nested routers. So now all contracts live under these right here instead of having to import every contract separately. So now we can come back here and we can say contracts dot auth dot login. Now, if you recall, and if I come here to the login contract, we have this path to be slash login and the path prefix to be slash auth. That means that here in the controller, we must get rid of this prefix because it is being handled automatically by the contract definition. And now we can define the logic, so public async login, and we need the response. And here, in fact, we need to pass in pass through to true. Now, the reason we use pass through is because the library needs total control of the response. So we need to tell Nest.js, hey, we just need the response to set some configuration like cookies, but I'm delegating the actual response to the library so that I don't have to do it manually. So I can say res of type response and response comes from express. And now we can say return TS rest handler. So this is what I'm talking about. This one handles the response. So we're delegating the response to the function instead. And then we can say contracts.auth.login. And then we have the actual function that is going to be invoked. Now look at the power of this. If I come here and extract something, as we can see, we get the headers. And if I do headers dot, as we can see, we have the authorization property. And this all comes from the sort schema we declared here. So if I come here, as we can see, we have c.string that starts with. So this is the power of TS REST. So now we can get the access token. So access token is equal to headers.authorization.replace. Now here's an error. Argument of type headers, all of this is not assignable to this promise and all of these complex types. This is a way to tell us that, hey, you're not returning anything valid that you defined in the contract. If I come here to the contract, we must respond with 200 and all of these other codes. So we can say status 200 and then we can say body and in the body, we define that we return a user. So for now, we can say email and then image and then name. And if we do this, the error goes away. 
So as we can see, TS REST is making sure that the endpoint returns what it should be returning. So what about the logic itself? Well, we're going to have this try catch since some of our logic will throw some errors. So we can say this.logger.error and we can return a status 500 and the body message. Now notice that if I were to say error instead of message, we get an error here because we're not returning what the contract specified. But if I change this back to message, everything works just fine. So let's lay out these steps. We need to first verify the access token. Second, we need to get the user info from our database. So synchronize the data from access token to our database. Then we need to create the session token with Firebase or set the session token as HTTP only. And we'll finally return the user info. So how do we verify the access token? Well, for this, I'll come here to the auth service. Let me actually close all of this. I'll come here again to the auth service. And we're going to have a logger, new logger, then the auth service that name, constructor, nothing here, and then public async, verify access token. And the access token is of type string. And actually, let us merge these two into one. So verify access token and get the user info. So let's do verify and absurd user. And this should return a promise of, and now we need to install Firebase admin. So we're going to write yarn add Firebase admin, which is the package we're going to use to create the session tokens. And once we have this installed, we can come here and say decoded token is decoded ID token. And we import this from Firebase slash auth. And we also need to return the user information. And this comes from the contract we defined. So we can say user info is equal to user. And we import it from our organization and then the library. And now we can write the body of the function. Okay, so now we need to set up a couple of things. First, we need to have the Firebase admin configuration which is the same as we did in the front end, but now for the back end. So under auth, I'll create a new file called firebaseadmin.module.ts. And this one will simply initialize the application and export it so that we can use it in our back end. So as you can see, you need to provide the project ID, the client email and the private key and place them in your .m file. Now, where do you get these keys? Well, if you recall, you downloaded a file with all of the private keys. So here are my keys. I'll just copy the whole private key. And then I'll open up my env and it's going to be the Firebase private key. Firebase private key is equal to and I'll paste this. And now I also need the project ID. So project ID is equal to and now I'll copy this key. And lastly, we need the client email. So client email is equal to and this one. So once you have this, you need to restart the server. Now we need to hook up our database. So for this, open up your terminal cd into API. And what I'm going to do is add the Prisma client as a dev dependency. And once this is done, we can write MPX Prisma in need. What this is going to do is create this Prisma directory with this schema. Now we're going to be using PostgreSQL for this. So this is fine. I'll actually get rid of this env as we have one in the root. And now we'll say database URL is equal to Postgres, then Postgres. So username is Postgres, password is Postgres, and then this will run at localhost 5432, and I'll name this test. 
So now we need a docker compose for our database. So create a new file at the root docker-compose.yaml and I'm going to paste this here. Now what we're simply doing is defining one service which is going to be the database. We're going to be using Postgres and we set up the environment for the user and password to be Postgres. Just as we have in the database URL, we map the port so it will listen to 5432 and we expose it to the host. And finally, we map the volume. So the data is persisted across container restarts. And now we need to add the volume definition, so volumes and then DB. And now we can open up the terminal and write docker compose up dash D. Dash D is the flag for detached mode, meaning that it won't take up your terminal process. And if I hit enter, we get an error because I already have something running at that port. So now let's try again. And as we can see, the container has started. So everything should work. Now what we can do is come here to the schema.prisma and let's add the model to represent our user. So model user ID string, this will be a UID. Let's also specify created ad, which is going to be date time, then now, and we're going to say db dot timestamp TC. So it has the time zone and map this internally to be created at instead. Then updated at the time updated at and then we can map this to updated at and this should be timestamp TZ. Then the name and this is not required and no need to map this. We need the email so string unique. And then the image, which is going to be the URL. This is not required either. And finally, we can map this to users. Most of the times, all of your queries will be from the email. So we can add an index for the email. So this is for faster querying, but with the trade-off of right performance degradation. So make sure to set indexes wisely. Okay, so now we need to push this schema to our database. For that, we need to specify or tell the Prisma CLI where this schema is. Now you can say npx, then Prisma db push, and then the flag, and you pass in the path. But for that, we can come here to our main package.json, and we can say Prisma, and then we can say schema apps slash API then prisma schema.prisma and if we save this come back here to the root and type this out as we can see it finds the schema.prisma from this path and it generated the prisma client for us now we can come here on the source and create on the wrap actually and create a file called prisma.module.ts and we're going to declare this now, this is a way to avoid instantiating the Prisma client multiple times, but we also get the benefit of providing these options so that we can see in the console in development what is going on. So once you have created this, we can now come back to the auth.service and we need to verify the token. So we can say const verified token is equal to await admin dot auth. And we import admin from the module we created and then we can say dot verify id token and we pass in the decoded or the access token so this will actually throw an error if it's invalid so how do we handle this error well for that we can come here and we can say if error instance of error then we can return status then http status dot and it's going to be forbidden. And then the message is going to be, you're not authorized to access this resource. Now we're getting an error. Let's see why. Do we have 403? We do not have 403. So it's best to just say unauthorized. And now the error goes away. As you can see, TS REST is quite powerful. Now the reason I use like this catch-all where the error is instance of error 
is because it's actually the only error of instance error that is going to be thrown by the service. So we know that if we catch an error that is instance of error, then it comes from Firebase. So now we can come back here to the service. And now from this line onwards, the token is verified. Because remember, this throws an error. So at this point, we can find or create the user. So we can say const user info is equal to await and then Prisma from the module we created. And then we can say dot user dot absurd. And then we can say where the email is the verified token dot email. And then we can create the email will be this one. So verified token dot email, then the name, then the image, which is actually IMG. Otherwise, we can update just the image and the name. And as for the select, we want to make sure to get the data that is required here from the user. So we need the email name and image. So let's say true to everything. And we also need the ID. Now there's something you need to take into account. What if you need the ID from your own database for every request that the user makes? So from the session token we're going to create. Well, as you can see, the verified token comes from Firebase. It doesn't know anything about your database. Well, sure, you have the email. But again, what if you need the ID or other information from your database? Well, for that, you can add some custom claims to the session token you're about to create. That way you can pass in maybe subscription data or the ID of the user, whatever you want. So for this, we can say await admin dot auth dot set custom user claims. And we must pass in the verified token dot UID. And then we can say DB user ID and then user info dot ID. So again, this is a way for every subsequent request, you can extract the ID from your own database, instead of having to query the database with the email. So where email is this email every single time you need to access the ID. And then we can return the decoder token, which let's actually rename this decoder token. And we also need to return the user info. Now image is missing because this will be IMG. So now we can come back to the controller and we can say await this dot auth service dot verify and absurd user and we pass in the access token. And from this we get the decoder token and the user info. Now we need to create the session token with Firebase which is the one we're going to set as an HTTP only cookie and will contain all of the information for our auth guard to validate every request. So now we can come here and back to the auth service and we can create a public asynchronous method, create session cookie. We need the access token, the original one, and this will return the session cookie and expire scene, which is going to be a number and then const expire scene. And this will be five days. Obviously, this is too short. You would aim for maybe two weeks, but I'm not sure if Firebase has a limit on the maximum expiration date for a session cookie. You'd have to consult the documentation for that. But for testing purposes, I'll use five days and then const session cookie await admin dot auth create session cookie we pass in the access token and then expire scene and then we can return the session cookie and expire scene so now we can come back here and we can say const session cookie expire scene is equal to await this dot auth service dot create session cookie and we pass in the original access token and we know that this access token is valid because at this point, this would throw an error if it's invalid. And now we can say res.cookie. We can say session, and then we can pass in the session cookie. And we can say max age, expire scene, HTTP only to be true. 
and it's going to be secure if it's in production. And the same side will be process.env.nodeenv is equal to production, then none otherwise lacks. And then I'll get rid of these comments. And now we can return status http status okay and then the body which is going to be the user information and we actually do not need the decoder token now we're getting an error here and that is because i forgot to get rid of this last return statement and as we can see everything seems to be working fine so now that we have this we need an endpoint to get the information for the user now it's true, we are returning the user information upon login, so the client shouldn't make a request to the slash me endpoint. But what if the user opens the application again? Well, it's going to perform a request to slash me, the auth guard would check if the user is authenticated, and then return the user information. So for this, we can scroll down and create a public async me, and this will be TS rest handler contracts.auth.me, which we have not created yet. And then we need the request. And this request for now, let's say it's going to be an express request. So type request, which is not entirely true. We'll see why in a moment. And then return TS rest handler. And here we will have the logic. So now let's create the me contract. So we'll come here and we're going to say me, then method will be get. Again, all of these will be mapped automatically by this decorator. Then we can say path slash me, then strict status codes, and then the responses. So we're going to have 200, which will be of type user, 403 if they are not authorized, so forbidden, then 404 if something went wrong from the client or not found rather, and then 500 if there is an internal error. For example, the database failed to do something. So now we can come back here and we would call, so I'm just going to write try catch error, and for now let's say this.logger.error then error add slash me and then return status internal server error and then the body which is message and internal okay so this slash me must be protected so we need to now create the auth guard so for this we can come here on the auth we can say guards then we can add an auth or firebase auth dot guard dot ts and then we can say this is going to be an injectable class because it's a guard. Then export class Firebase auth guard implements can activate. So this is the class for the logic of classes. As we can see, can activate function must be implemented by a guard. So this handles the middleware logic. So we can say public async can activate. We get the context, which is execution context which comes from nest.js, and we must return a boolean, so true if it's authorized, false if not. So we can get the request, context.switch to HTTP, then get request, and this will be of type request, which is just express under the hood. So we import type request, and then we can try and see if there's a session cookie. So const session cookie is equal to request.cookies, dot session as a string or undefined or null let's be safe here then we can check if not a session cookie then return false because this means that if there is no session cookie the user has never logged in so they are not authorized and then we can return admin from the firebase module we created and then we can say dot auth dot verify session cookie we pass in the session cookie and then true, which is to check if it has been revoked. Now, in fact, we can use await instead here. So decoded claims is equal to awaited this. And let's use try catch. So catch error and return false. And now we need to check if the decoded claims contains an email. 
Now you might be wondering how come the decoded claims contains an email property which is optional. Well, that is because Firebase authentication offers phone authentication, so it doesn't require the user to input an email. That's why it can be nullable. In our case, we're going to only be using email authentication. If this were phone authentication as well, you need to switch the logic up a little bit. So we can say return true, and then we can set to the request a user property. So on all of our guarded endpoints, we can access the user information that comes from the session cookie. So we can say request.user is equal to, and then email decoded to claims.email, and then the ID decoded claims.db user ID. And then we can return true. Now there's an error because well request doesn't contain this user property. So we can export a type, export type, request with the user, request and the user. So ID string, then email will be string. And it also contains the token. And now we can replace this and the error goes away. So now we can come back here and we can say, use guards, then Firebase auth guard. And this request will actually be request with user because we know the guard will protect the endpoint. Hence the request will always be this request with the user. So now we can get the user info. So we can come here to the auth service and then public async get user info and then the user ID string and we must return a promise of user. And actually, let's do it via the email instead. So where email is this one. And if there is no user info, we can throw new TS rest exception. And we can say contracts dot auth dot me. And then the body will be a message user not found. And then status 404. So this exception will be handled by this REST handler. So we can say if error instance of TS REST exception, then we just throw the error. So this function can catch this error and handle it automatically. So this is a way to also get type safety when you need to throw errors outside of a controller. So we have this one right here, we pass in the contract and it is going to make sure that what you specify here in the response corresponds with what you defined in the contract. So now we can say return status HTTP status dot OK. And then the body will be await this dot auth service dot get user info and we pass in the email. Now we can improve here the logic where we select the user information, because if you notice, we're using the same select for these two. So in that case, we can say const user select is equal to, and we can say satisfies prisma dot user select. So now we can come here and we get autocomplete type safety, and we can specify all of these three or four properties. And then we can say user select here and as well as here. And now we avoid code duplication. And lastly, let us implement the logout controller. So I'll come here to contracts, then say logout method will be post, then path slash logout, then the body. This is not going to contain anything. So no strict status codes and then responses. 200 if logged out, 400 by request, 401 if not authorized, then 404 if not found, and finally 500 if something went wrong on our end. So now we can come back to the controller and we can say TS REST handler, logout, use guards, well they must be authenticated obviously, then we need to get the response so pass through, then we clear the cookie and we need to revoke the token because at this point we may have removed the cookie, but what if someone got hold of that cookie as well? They could still make requests. So for this, await this.auth service.revoke token. 
and we pass in the request.cookies.session and now we can come here and declare in the auth service public async revoke token we need the session cookie this returns a promise of boolean and then we get the error let's see if i have a logger in this case i do so this.logger.error and this should be error revoking token and then const decoded claims is equal to await admin dot auth dot verify session cookie we check if it's revoked either way and then await dot revoke refresh tokens now there's a problem this will revoke all sessions for a specified user so this is going to log you out from everywhere i believe and then return true and as we can see all of this is now correctly set up but before moving on to the front end one last change here in the logout we check if it's a ts rest exception so let's come here to revoke token and instead just return void and then we can throw a new ts rest exception and we can say error revoking token now you need to check if the error comes from the verify session cookie for example if error instance of error then throw new ts ts rest exception and we can say the body message will be you're not authorized or something like that and then the status unauthorized but i'm not sure whatever this would throw so maybe if this fails then this would be executed either way let's leave it like this so now for the front end let's come here under source then leave and let's create the api.ts config and this will be export const api in need query client and this comes from let's see if we have it in need query client from add ts rest react query and then we can say base url let's leave it as i believe it's 3000 this would come from an environment variable obviously and then credentials include and then the base headers nothing and here in fact since we're using ts rest we must pass in the contracts so now with this we can say api.auth.login and then use mutation or even dot auth dot me dot use query and as we can see we get a total type safety very similar to trpc so now we can come here to the main.csx we can export const the query client new query client and this comes from client and query client provider from add handstack react query so it seems like we do not have it. So yarn add tanstack react query. And now we can create the query client and then pass in the query client provider. We pass in the client and we wrap this up. Let us now create the sustent store. So yarn add sustent. And then now under lib, I'll create a store and this will be use auth store.ts. And we're going to export type auth store and we're going to make it quite similar to next auth where they have the status authenticated or loading or unauthenticated. Then the user, so from the contract, then clear well when the user signs out and then the set which is new data set state i believe comes from sustent and it seems like it's deprecated so this would actually be store api and then the auth store in set state however we do not have the store so export const use auth store create this comes from sustent then the auth store, then set, user is initially null, status is loading, 
because we do not know at this point if the user is authenticated or not. Then the clear and finally the set and we invoke the set with the function. So set new data and then set the new data. And this is actually returning an object. And then we can say auth store. So just to recap, we set the user to null. We do not know if they are authenticated or not. Then loading, because we're going to perform a fetch request to slash me, see if the user is authenticated. We provided this clear function just so if the user needs to log out, well, we provide this to perform it all in the client side instead of hard refreshing the website. And then we have this set of function so that we can manipulate the data from the user. Obviously, this is all client side. So for instance, you may use this set function when we log in the user, we need to set the data. Or if you have subscription status, the user paid a subscription, then you can update it here instead of making unnecessary requests to the server. Now let's rename these two books instead. And inside here, we're going to create a use session.ts hook. Now this use session return will have a user, which is the auth uh, store at user, then the status, then a refresh. So if we want to refresh the query for the slash me, then sign out. And this will return a promise of void. So now let's export a function use session use session return, we need the auth store. So use auth store, then const navigate is equal to use navigate from react router dump, then const sign out mutation is equal to API from our configs dot auth dot logout dot use mutation. And then we can say on success, we simply clear the auth store and we navigate to slash root where we have our login. Now we need the query to get the data of the signed in user. So for this, we can say me query api.auth.me use query. This is the key. So me, then the fetcher. So we can say me.query. So this is the function that will perform the query behind the scenes as if you were to use Axios or fetch. And then we can say query key is me, which is an array. And now we can pass in some other information. So we can say whether it's enabled. And in this case, we can say when the user is equal to null. And the reason we do this is because when the user signs in, we know that the login endpoint returns the user information. So we do not want the me query to perform another query again, when we already know we have the data. So that's why we provide this enabled, then we can say refetch on Windows focus, then false, we can have a retry function. So we get the failure count and the error. And for this, we can say, Hey, if the error is 403, then do not retry the query because we know the user is not authenticated. And we can also pass in how many times we want the query to retry in case there's an error, like say network error or something of the like. So for this, we can say return error dot status different from 403 and the failure count is less than three. Okay. So now we need to have a way to set to the auth store, the user information that is returned from this query. Previously, you had access to the on success and the on error callbacks. However, they got rid of them. As you can see in this article, breaking react queries API on purpose. And there's a whole explanation of why they did it and what you can do instead. So how can we handle these success and the error states then? Well, for this, we can access the fetcher. So we can say this will be an asynchronous function. And then we await this query. So this is what's great about TS rest is that it exposes you to the actual query. So you can say const result is equal to await this, and then you can return the result. This is the exact same thing. 
but now we can check the response so we can say if response dot status is equal to 403 then what we can do is clear the auth store and navigate to the login button or rather the login page otherwise if the rest dot status is equal to 200 then we can set the auth store and we can now say the status is authenticated and the user is the rest.body. It's as simple as this. So now having done this, we can return the user and the sign out is going to be an asynchronous function. And we're simply going to await mutate sync and the body is null. And that now we can use this use session hook to check if the user is authenticated, to sign out, as well as to get the user information. So now we can come here on their source, create a new folder, components, and then guards. And then we can say auth guard or wrapper.csx. And this could be named layouts or whatever. And then we can say const auth wrapper. This is going to be our React function component. And we get the props, so children. And we can use this use session hook. So we can say const session is equal to use session. And then we can check if session.status is equal to loading or session.status is equal to an authenticated then we can return for now loading otherwise we can return the children and now we can come here to the main file and this is the protected route so we can say auth wrapper okay so now if you tried running your client you would throw an error and the reason is because we installed a react query version that isn't compatible with ts rest so for this, make sure to specify up to the fourth version. That way, everything will work as intended. Now, there's one issue though, and I forgot completely that here, when you use the api.auth, so auth.me and then dot use query, the second argument isn't the fetcher because that is being handled by TS REST automatically which is here from this API object. So that's why our logic still wouldn't work. So while TS REST migrates to support the fifth version of React Query, the solution for now would be to simply use the use query hook from React Query raw. And then you would specify the query function to be this one. So auth.me.query. And in fact, this is how you can perform queries without the use of a hook. Because let's say you're using Vue or Angular or something that doesn't have hooks like React does. Then what you can do is if you come here to the TS REST core, as you can see, they use client.getPosts and they invoke this function, which is basically like a wrapper for Axios. But in this case, it provides full type safe support based on the contracts that you define. So we keep everything the same. But again, we replace this use query with the base use query from React query. And then here for the error, you're going to get an error because the error is typed as unknown. So what you need to do is come here over to the API contracts and you need to export type get me response and then server infer responses and then you pass in the contract of the endpoint that you need the types and what this is going to do is give you all of these statuses so now if you come here and say error.status as you can see it is inferred as 200 404 500 or 403 which works perfectly so now if you make these changes and you come back here and let's say we want to go to the dashboard page we get automatically redirected and we get 403 forbidden. Now there is a huge problem and that is if you log to the console the success error and loading states and you go to the dashboard page 
as you can see, success is false, which is true. Loading is true, then it's going to be false. But the important part is the error. As we can see, the error is null. And that is because the error is not being handled by React Query when we do this. So you lose a very important feature of React Query. So while we wait for TS REST to update their API to support React Query version 5 and onwards, the best solution for now is to simply use the original query with the deprecated methods, which is obviously not ideal. So in this case, const me query API dot auth me then dot use query then me then this would be the parameters here you can define the enabled the retry now this will get inferred correctly then on error as we can see it is deprecated then the on success which is as well deprecated and i believe that's everything we have the retry the error and the unsuccess so now if i get rid of this and check the success error and loading hit save come back here go back to the dashboard this time we now get the error property so make sure to keep an eye out on ts rest anyway now that we have this we can come back to the login page and we can say const login mutation is equal to api dot auth dot login then use mutation and then this one has the unsuccess. This is not deprecated. So we can get the data. Then the auth store. So const auth store is equal to use auth store. And then auth store dot set the status to be authenticated. And then the user to be data dot body. And then we can redirect the user. So const navigate is equal to use navigate. And then here navigate to the dashboard and now all we need to do is say await login mutation dot mutate asynchronous and then here we can pass in the headers and authorization and bearer access token and we're getting an error here because i believe the body is missing as we can see here which is null so we can say null and this actually comes outside of the headers so null and now if we do this everything should work just fine our server should authenticate us and i actually forgot one last thing and that is using const session is equal to use session and here we must disable the button if the session dot status is equal to loading or the session dot status is equal to authenticated and that is this is going to perform the slash me request and it's going to check well if the user is authenticated or not so in this case we do not want to allow a user to try to sign in if they are already signed in so we can say if the session that status is equal to loading otherwise session that status authenticated signed in just to make sure and if not sign in now if i save this and come back i should be able to now test this out obviously the server is running at my same machine so that's why there's a very small flash of the bottom being disabled now before you test this out i'm not sure if this was copilot but this should be in the firebase auth guard if not the email then return false otherwise it is never going to set the user information here and then now if we do this hit save and i'll have to clear my cookies so i'm not authenticated hit refresh now if i test this out click sign in as we can see i get redirected to the dashboard so now let's try and see the user information so I'll come here to the dashboard page and let's do create a new page actually. So dashboard.page.csx export const dashboard page react.fc and then here we can return the auth wrapper and let's get the session. So const session is equal to use session. 
and then we can json that stringify the session dot user and let's see what we get back so let's replace this with the dashboard page and let's get rid of this import now if i come back here as we can see we get the email the image the name and the id so everything is working just fine now what about the logout well that's pretty basic you simply come here and we can place this in a span and then we can add a button which says logout and then the on click which is simply session dot sign out and we invoke this function and now if we do this hit save come back here as we can see loading we are authenticated we can access this page and now if we click on the logout it takes a little bit and as we can see we get redirected to the sign in now if i try to go to the dashboard we get an error and now if i sign in again i should get redirected and everything works fine so as we can see, using Firebase for authentication is very straightforward. It simplifies the process a lot. Doing this from scratch would take a lot of effort. Now all you need to do is use the auth wrapper in any page that requires authentication. If you're using a framework like Next.js, well, you can add this in a server-side middleware. So the user doesn't even see this flash. They either get the page instantly or they get redirected, which provides a better user experience. Now, as for the server, well, you have this auth guard. So you can say use guards in whatever endpoint you need, or in fact, you can come here to a controller and say use guards, Firebase guard, and now your whole controller is protected. So now what's next? Well, the problem with logging out is I believe it logs you out from every single session. So if the user is connected in multiple browsers, phones, computers, they will get logged out from all of their devices. And this is a limitation from Firebase. In that case, you could employ your own mechanism to store these session tokens or even get rid of the logic of handling session tokens with Firebase and creating your own JWT session tokens. That way you're delegating everything to yourself, except for the initial process, which would be opening the provider and getting the access token from the client side. I hope you enjoyed this crash course. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe. You can find the repository in the description. See you soon.